Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here to talk to you about second order Cauchy Euler equations. Sometimes these are just called Euler equations. These have the form ax squared y double prime plus bxy prime plus cy equals zero or equals g of x. If it's equal to zero, it's a homogeneous equation. If it's equal to some non-zero function of x, then it's non-homogeneous. How to easily recognize that you have an Euler equation, you'll notice that the power of x is the same as the order of the derivative in each term. So I have no x here with just cy. I have a single power of x with the first derivative and the second derivative term has an x squared in all of these equations. In this video, we're just going to focus on the solution methods for the homogeneous equations that are Euler equations. We also have a video next in our series about solving the non-homogeneous versions of these equations using variation of parameters. Recently in your study of second order equations, you've probably solved linear equations that had constant coefficients, and the fundamental solution set involved exponential functions. Here our method for solving these Euler equations, our fundamental solution set is actually going to involve x to some power, so polynomial functions instead of exponential functions. If we assume that a homogeneous equation like this, an Euler equation, has some sort of a solution that is x to some power m, then we should be able to take this and plug it into the equation and get a true statement. Now we could plug this in for y. We would still need y prime and y double prime. And to find y prime and y double prime for this, we would just use a power rule, right? So the derivative of y, y prime, the m would come out front and our power would go down by 1. So we get m times x to the m minus 1. Doing the same thing again for y double prime, the power would again come out, so we actually get m times m minus 1 as a quantity, times x to the m minus 2, the power going down by 1 again. So that we can figure out a pattern of x to the m being a solution, let's plug all of this into our equation. So we'll get something that looks like this, ax squared times our y double prime, plus bx times our y prime, plus c times our y equal to 0. And if you notice what happens when we multiply x squared into this, the power is going to go up by 2 here. That would change the power of this back into x to the m. So we would actually get am m minus 1 times x to the m. A similar thing will happen in this b term. If I take x times this x to the m minus 1, the power will then go up by 1 because we have one more copy of x multiplying in. And that would then give us bm times x to the m. Obviously this is already an x to the m term, so we'll just keep thinking of that as c times x to the m equals zero. And now you'll notice this x to the m is actually a common factor that we can just factor out entirely in the front. And we have x to the m times this am m minus one plus bm plus c. If we actually do some distributing and combining of like terms, then we'll actually get am squared plus b minus a m plus c equal to zero. And one way that we can ensure that this is going to be zero, since I have something times a quantity here equaling zero, would be when everything in the brackets here, this a m squared plus b minus a m plus c is equal to zero. So to find solutions to our Euler equations, we have this new equation for m. We used to think of a characteristic polynomial when we were solving these second order linear equations. And now with Euler equations, we have this new equation for m. And if we solve this equation for m, just using factoring again, or quadratic formula, or completing the square, then we can find our fundamental solution set of x to the m and get the general solution for these equations. Let's go ahead and solve a couple of basic examples with you here. So we have x squared y double prime minus 3xy prime plus 3y equals 0. You can see x squared with y double prime, x with y prime, and no x's with the y term. So this is an Euler equation. If we look here, we'll notice that a is equal to 1 in this case, b is negative 3, and c is 3. Now we definitely want to notice that this equation for m is different than before. We have b minus a as our m coefficient, so just be careful when you're setting up your equation for m. Our equation for m here, if a is 1, that would be 1m squared, also known as m squared, plus, and then we have b minus a, and b minus a would be negative 3 minus 1, which would be negative 4. So we actually have negative 4m plus our c, c is 3 there, so we have m squared minus 4m plus 3 is equal to 0. This one is factorable. We can factor this as m minus 1, times m minus 3 equal to 0. If we set each of these factors equal to 0, m minus 1 is 0, 
and m minus 3 is 0, then we get answers m equals 1 and m equals 3. Now remember our solutions are of the form y equals x to the m. So our first function, our y1 in this case, is going to be x to the 1, which obviously is just x here, and then our y2 in this case is going to be x to the other m value, x to the 3 or x cubed. So when we write our solution, we'll actually say c1 times y1, which is x, plus c2 times y2, which is x cubed. So instead of getting exponentials based on these m values, right, you can see we're actually getting polynomial terms based on these m values. Let's look at another here. 2x squared y double prime plus 3xy prime minus y is equal to 0. Here we can see that a is equal to 2, b is equal to 3, and c is equal to negative 1. Let's build our equation for m. So am squared is now going to be 2m squared plus b minus a, b minus a would be 3 minus 2, which would be 1, so we would actually say plus 1m, or just plus m, plus c, which would be minus 1, is equal to 0. This is actually factorable as well, so here we'll actually get 2m minus 1 times m plus 1 when we factor this. If we set each of these factors equal to 0, say 2m minus 1 is equal to 0, and m plus 1 is equal to 0. This one here is going to give us, if we add 1 and divide by 2, that m is 1 half, and here we'll just get that m is negative 1. So that then tells me that y1 is actually x to the 1 half, and y2 is actually x to the negative 1. I'm going to write these a little bit differently when I write my general solution. So if y is equal to c1y1, then c1y1 x to the 1 half might be better written as the square root of x. So c1 root x plus c2 y2, y2 is x to the negative 1, that's the same as 1 over x, right? So we could also write this as plus c2 over x and avoid any fraction or negative exponents in our answer. Of course, it's possible that we don't get two distinct real solutions for our equation for m, two distinct real roots. So if I just get one solution, say m sub 1, and it has multiplicity 2, could I write my solution as c1x to the m1 plus c2x to the m1? And the answer is no, because this cannot be a fundamental set of solutions. These are not linearly independent. They're certainly multiples of one another if you look at this. And so we'll need to establish some sort of way to achieve linear independence when we have a repeated real root for our equation for m. So if we get a single real repeated root, so we have a root of multiplicity 2 for our equation for m, our fundamental solution set will actually be x to that power and x to that power times a natural log of absolute value x multiplying by ln absolute value x will give us another solution that works and it is also linearly independent from our other function here. So our general solution will be some multiple of x to the m1 plus some other multiple of x to the m1 times a natural log of x function there. Let's work through a couple of examples of that here. So we have x squared y double prime minus 3xy prime plus 4y is equal to 0. You can see in this case our a is equal to 1, our b is equal to negative 3, and our c is equal to 4. Now remember our equation for m is a m squared plus, don't forget, b minus a times m plus c is equal to 0. So we'll need to solve that equation for m. Using this a, b, and c, we'll actually get 1 m squared, which is m squared. b minus a would be negative 3 minus 1, which is negative 4. So we'll have minus 4 m plus c gives us plus 4 equal to 0. This will factor. It will factor into the same thing twice. We actually get m minus 2 times m minus 2 if we factor this, also known as m minus 2 quantity squared equal to 0. So when I solve this, I'm only able to set m minus 2 equal to 0, and that gives us an m value of 2, and this has multiplicity 2 because the factor appeared twice, right? So we'll get this solution actually twice. So when we say what our fundamental set of solutions are, our y1 will be x to this power here, what m was, x squared. Our y2 then will actually be this same x to the m, but times a natural log of absolute value x expression there. So we'll go ahead and say our 
general solution will be C1Y1, so C1X squared plus C2Y2, so C2X squared LN of X. Looking at our next one, 4x squared y double prime plus 8xy prime plus y is equal to 0. In this case, a is equal to 4, b is equal to 8, and c is equal to 1. We'll write it down one more time. am squared plus b minus a m plus c is equal to 0. Our equation for m for this particular problem then will be 4m squared. Notice that b minus a will be 4, so we'll get plus 4m plus c, which is plus 1, equal to 0. If we factor this, this actually factors into the same thing twice as well. This would factor as 2m plus 1 times another 2m plus 1. So we'll go ahead and call this as before 2m plus 1 quantity squared equal to 0. If we set one of these equal to 0, 2m plus 1 equal to 0, subtract 1 and divide by 2, we'll give you that m is negative 1 half, but we had multiplicity 2 because the factor appeared twice. So this is a repeated real root. So here we'll get y1 equals x to the negative 1 half. Now another way to write this would be reciprocal and a square root, so we can write this as 1 over the square root of x. And y2 would actually be this thing, 1 over root x, times a natural log function, so we'll get 1 over root x, ln absolute value x. You can go ahead and write this log expression and the constants on the top if you would like. So if we say c1 y1, we might say c1 over square root x. Plus, we might also put this on the top, we'll say C2 ln of absolute value x divided by root x also. The third possibility when solving our equation for m, we actually maybe get complex conjugate roots. So we get some alpha plus or minus beta i. We use alpha and beta here in our videos because we don't want to confuse them with a and b that we have in our original expression here. Alpha is the real part of our solution. Beta is the complex coefficient here. Remember, this is really the same as two separate solutions just written in one statement. This is saying one solution is alpha plus beta i, and the other solution is alpha minus beta i. Of course, these are always going to occur in complex conjugates. And when we get these complex solutions for our equation for m, then our general solution form is still going to have c1 x to the real part. Notice x to the alpha here comes from the real part in each of these. One of the equations will be times cosine of beta ln absolute value x, and the other one will be times sine of beta ln of absolute value x. If you've worked with complex solutions for the characteristic polynomial, the equation for m for second order linear equations, remember you had something similar involving sine and cosine, but notice that these expressions are a bit different. Here we have a multiple of ln x inside of cosine and sine instead of just a multiple of x. So be real careful when you're dealing with your solution form with these Euler equations, and don't make the mistake of using a form similar to something you did before. We'll work our final two examples focusing on these complex situations here. So we have x squared y double prime plus xy prime plus 16y is equal to 0. In this case, a is equal to 1, b is also equal to 1, and c here is 16. So remember our equation for m is am squared plus b minus a m plus c is equal to 0, and in this case that would be 1m squared. So our equation for m here is m squared. b minus a would be 1 minus 1, so we would get 0m, there's no m term. We just get m squared plus 16 in this case. If we subtract 16 from both sides, we'll get that m squared is equal to negative 16, and taking the square root of both sides is going to give us m is equal to plus or minus 4i. So in this instance, our alpha is actually 0 and our beta is actually 4. So in this instance, our general solution should be c1x to the 0 cosine of 4 ln absolute value of x plus c2x to the 0 again, and this time sine of our beta, which is 4, ln absolute value of x. Now these x to the zeros we don't want to write, 
that would just be 1, right? So we'll just go ahead and say C1 cosine of our 4 ln absolute value x plus C2 times sine of that. You can see we're not getting any polynomial expression really because our real part of our complex solution was zero. We had a purely imaginary solution for each of our m's there. Let's look at one example where we don't get an alpha of zero. Here we have x squared y double prime minus 5xy prime plus 13y equals zero. a is equal to one here, b is negative five, and c is 13. And if we set up our a m squared plus b minus a m plus c equal to zero, then I would get one m squared Negative 5 minus 1 would give us minus 6m here, plus 13, equal to 0. You can probably tell by looking at this that this does not factor. We'll use the quadratic formula here. You could complete the square if you prefer. If we use the quadratic formula, we'd get negative b, which would be a positive 6, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which would be 36, minus 4ac, which would be 4 times 1 times 13, which is 52, all over 2a, which is 2. And if we simplify this, we'll actually get 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 over 2. This is actually going to be 4i, so we'll get 6 plus or minus 4i all over 2. And then that would actually give us a simplified version of 3 plus or minus 2i. So in this instance, our alpha is 3 and our beta is 2. That then tells us that our general solution for this one will be c1 x to the alpha, so that would be x cubed cosine of beta ln of x, so that will actually be 2 ln of x plus c2 x cubed sine of beta ln x, so 2 ln x. Alright everyone, hopefully this helps you solve your homogeneous Euler equations with distinct real roots, repeated real roots, and complex roots for your equation for m. If you're looking to solve non-homogeneous Euler equations, go ahead and check out our next video in the series. Thanks for watching, we'll see you then.